All right, here we go. So first of all, uh, just like what Miranda have said just now, okay. So what we are gonna have today is uh, all about color today. But first half of the class, we are going to go with theories. But rest assured that it's gonna be fun. No worries, okay. I put in some like uh, some cute pictures and fun stories inside there already, okay. So cool. First of all, I'd like to show a little bit of. Um, the birth of color grading technology for films. So what is color grading? Color grading is basically we are giving story and life into whatever that the director and the director of photography have shot on the set and to give meaning to the, uh, the whole base, the whole film. So this is our role, okay, as a colorist, okay? And uh, for those who did not attend the class last week, I'm... Uh, I'm a video editor and also colorist that uh, do different different kinds of contents from various various contents from like music video to feature films for cinema and then for uh, uh, what else corporate videos and commercials a lot of commercials and uh, you'll be able to see some of the magic that we put into the into the uh, video that we make today but today I won't show a lot of videos but a lot more still pictures than we did and also some of the secrets i'll be revealing today that is the best thing okay so let's head on to our slides okay everybody thinks that films and movie is all about art okay but that is now but what happened last time okay honestly film and movie is actually born out of technology only then art is applied. Let's talk about the birth of motion picture film. How does it come about? What happened and what inspires someone to make something into a motion picture film and then make it into a commercial film and then go into art and then apply arts and emotions in it. And then today, until today, okay, we have so many different kinds of contents for us, available for us to watch. So many different movies, so many different genres. What even is genre last time? There's no such thing. Only that people apply this. Okay? So, 1.1, chapter 1.1. Birth of motion picture film. So, this is one of the most important pictures that inspires the whole, uh, the whole thing about movies. Okay? So, what is so important about this particular picture? So what you can see here in the picture is someone is riding a horse, right? Nothing important, right? Okay, here comes the story, all right? So this picture was taken by a photographer called Edward Muybridge, okay, in year 1877. So Edward Muybridge is a British-American photographer, okay? And what happened is he was employed by a horse breeder last time. And uh, he was hired to actually uh, take picture of the horses. But most importantly, what kind of picture is that? <clears throat> um, because those, like last time, when these guys are so boring, okay, when they are bored, they would like to do like bettings and things like that. Okay, and then at some point, they will say, actually, uh, I think I realized when the horse run, uh, I think all the four legs, uh, uh, the four hooves are actually up in the air, you know? They are floating in the air. So is that even impossible? Like, like how on earth do you even see that? Like horses run so fast. So okay, then they hired Edward Weebridge and then they say, Hey bro, I want to take a picture of my horses run and then I would like you to prove that uh, when horses run, now all the hooves, four hooves are actually lifted on the air. Is that possible? And then he say, um, I think Ken Kua. Let's do this. Okay, so. He go ahead and set up 12 of this kind of uh, camera, okay? Something like that. Last time it's very old school. So, uh, it looks, it doesn't look like a modern DSL up now. It looks like a box with like three legs and then like a cute little lens in front. Okay, so he set up something like the 12 of these at the, um, at the, at the tracks, okay? So, uh, how does it work is that uh, he actually thought of setting uh, all these 12 cameras right beside the track and then also he set like uh, wires that stretch along, along the tracks. 
So when the horses run and then trick the wire, it will activate the shutter. And then it will take a picture. And then after that, he make them into something like that. Okay? So basically, 12 of these cameras, they took a picture when, they, uh, when the horses run through, these, uh, run through the wires and then it activates the camera, the shutter, and then take a picture, click, 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 12 pictures of them, and then they paste them all together into something like that. Okay? So you will be able to see there are 12 pictures of horses running, but the cool thing is that Edward Weaverish actually put these images on the rotating disk and then projected them on the screen through a magic lantern. And here is the end result. Okay, so in this picture, he proves to the friends that actually bet with the uh, horse breeder owner and say, no lah, where got, where got the horses running? Uh, where got the four hooves lift on the air? Okay, so Edward Murraybridge proved them wrong. And as you can see that there, uh, all the hooves are actually lifted. Okay, so because of this kind of uh, lack of technology last time, people actually become very smart in terms of thinking, what should I do to prove people wrong? Okay, and then they actually come up with like a brand new technology of putting pictures together and it becomes the first ever motion picture firm. And from then onwards, everything starts changing. Okay, so that is the first ever motion picture film that we see. Unfortunately, it's uh, horses lah. It's not like uh, some, some more interesting things that we see. But okay, but this is actually very interesting to know about history and also about how it came about. Okay, so remember the first motion picture film is someone, running a uh, someone riding a horse running. Chapter 1.2 the first public film screening. So when people actually started to know more about this technology, about like motion picture film, they started to think, okay, um, you know, instead of using like uh, 12 different cameras to make like one motion picture, I'm going to use like uh, just one camera to make movies, okay? Something like that to make films, motion picture, okay? And then after that, when the technology gets better and better, what happened is that they get in and then to, uh, to get serious and then they started to make public film screening. Okay, so these two guys, who is these two Agmore? Okay, so these two Agmore, their names is called Auguste and Louis Lumiere. Okay, uh, they are French. <laughs> they are the Lumiere brothers from France, uh, from France. Okay, they are French guys. Okay, they were the first people who organized the first public film screening. Okay, but what is so important about the first public film screening? There's nothing important, right? But actually, it's that important because this particular film called um, El Arrivi d'un train en guerre de la Ciota. Okay, something like that. Okay, of course, I don't understand what. Uh, I don't understand French, like, I can't really pronounce it, but the English translation is the arrival of a train at La Ciota Station, or La Ciota Station, okay? Correct me if I'm wrong, okay? So, they play this film into, uh, for, uh, in the film screening, to a huge bunch of French inside a room, okay? And I'd like to show you how the film looks like, okay? Here we go. So, it's a video about uh, a train slowly approaching, approaching, and comes nearer. All right. And then, in this video, it's interesting it's also because we get to see how French people dress last time. Okay. Like, wow, you'll be able to see, like, some cool, like, costumes, uniform, that how the train looks like last time. Interesting, right? Okay? But, the thing is, to us, it's very interesting because it's very normal for us, okay? Alright, I'm going to skip the video because it's just like that, okay? It's just a train approaching to the station, okay? So, imagine a huge bunch of French sitting inside a room 
first time seeing a firm of a train approaching nearer, nearer to you. What happened? What is their reaction? Let me tell you what happened, okay? What happened is that they freak out just like these cats. Okay, <laughs> that is the interesting thing that happened when the audiences actually see the firm for the first time ever in their whole life. Okay? Astaghfirullah. Saya saya kata kujud. Okay, exactly. This is how they react. Okay? Because of this, the Lumia brothers actually realized that, eh, it's just, uh, I just take my camera and then go and shoot. Like a train approaching to the station. What is so, what is so kanchong about it? Because the thing is, imagine you sit inside a cinema theater for the first time in, in your whole life and then you get to see a train slowly approaching to you. Does it look real or not? I'm telling you, it's so damn real that everybody reacted to kajut and that's how they actually even go and hide at the back of the whole theater. Okay? So that is what happened last time. And then the Lumia brothers actually said, Wow, hey, Shit, I'm sorry I have to swear a bit. Shit, like a film like this actually give a huge impact, an emotional impact to the audiences. And from then, everything start to change. Okay, imagine a silent film already have this kind of huge impact. Okay, and then even we watch, uh, what's his name? Um, Charlie Chaplin, silent film, but with music, we also have such a huge impact already. And then now we have Marvels, we have DC, we have like uh, comment, uh, comedy, romance comedy, romance comedy, so many different genres that give us different kind of impacts. It's all thanks to all these guys who actually figured out that, wow, a film actually gives emotional impact. And last time, it just people go and bet like, hey, I don't think horses uh, leave their four hooves uh, when they run, okay? So this is the evolution of motion picture film, okay? And from there, everything starts to change. Chapter 1.3, innovations of colors in film, okay? Big word, innovation, but trust me, it's going to be fun, okay? So first, long, long time ago, okay? Long time ago, there's only black and white negative processing. So all the films, all the movies that we watched last time has no color. Okay? Uh, to those youngsters that have never seen the black and white film, okay, go and search uh, on Google what are the black and white films on YouTube and stuff like that. Go and watch, okay? They're very interesting. Alright? So, uh, so, what they did last time to... Uh, uh, process black and white negative is that they actually uses some kind of med, uh, negative, uh, sorry, uh, some kind of chemicals to process all the films after they shot. So uh, to try to get a black and white image out of the films because last time it's just negative. There's technically no uh, positive image, so they have to process it in order to get the image out of it. Okay, and what they can control is last time they can only control how bright or dark the picture is but they can never see a color, okay? So, and then at some point, some guys say, hey, our film's black and white, only so boring, okay? I'm going to make it to colorful, but how? There's no technology yet, how to make things look colorful, okay? And then some kind of guys like came up with a brilliant idea again, okay? The idea is, what is the closest thing that we can get to make things colorful? Okay, what is it? The answer is painting. So, some, some genius actually go and do like hand-colored films. Okay, so this is an example of uh, hand-colored films. It's actually called A Trip to the Moon. Okay, and uh, it's uh, produced in year 1902. And Jerry, you are correct. These guys actually painted every single frame. Okay? If you guys don't believe me, go ahead and Google it. Google it, okay? A Trip to the Moon, year 1902. It's crazy. So what happened is that the filmmaker actually hired a bunch of painters and then they worked in like a kilang or something like that. And then they actually used physical brushes and paint. 
to paint on every single frame, every single clothes they wear. That's why you can see there are green clothes, okay? This one, green clothes, green cardigan, and then also yellow and red and things like that. I'm telling you, this is crazy. This is crazy. Imagine how many people is going to work for a motion picture film back then. For example, a 20, 20 minute film, how long they are going to take? How many people are going to work on this film? It's crazy, the process. And then, imagine how many different prints they have to work on. You see, because they are not, there's not only one movie theater last time, there's so many of them, okay? So how many different prints? So what happened is that all the different movies, in different theater will look a bit different because of like the paints they use and then also different people are painting different things so they might feel a bit different and then the shades and things like that they will definitely look different okay and the picture that you see here okay every single frame all the greens and red might blurry a bit they will look slightly different okay i'm telling you it's crazy okay so what happened after a hand color first okay what happened is that some guys actually going to complain, wow, Lao, eh, so much work. Okay, again, technology makes human lazy. Okay, it's not making us better, it's just making us lazy, I swear. Okay, so too much work. And then some kind of genius came up with an idea, ah, you so much work. How about we don't do hand color films anymore? We are going to shoot everything in color like easier. Okay, so again, human being human, what they do is that. They, they actually invented something called Technicolor. Okay? Technicolor 2 strip and 3 strip technique. What the heck is that? Okay? So, let me tell you a bit of history. Okay? So, actually, Technicolor now, now uh, in the year 2020, Technicolor is actually a post production house. What is a post production house? Uh, post production house is actually a place where we do all our film editing, color grading, visual effects, and audio post. It's a huge, huge company in the United States. Okay, but they also have some branches. Lah. They also have like in uh, I think in the UK, and back then we actually have a branch in Thailand. But the thing is, uh, it got closed down and then the company called G2D bought over and then they took over it, okay? So, Technicolor back then is actually a technique for color in film. They actually invented to use two different strips of films or either three different strips of films, okay? Combine it together, process it together, and then in order to uh, actually process uh, a colored film, okay? So it's actually a very expensive and also a very uh, um, heavy process that I would say. I would love to see how it actually works, but due to whatever the technology right now that we have, okay, this technique is not available anymore because, again, if you'd like to see more, you can Google it. It's a crazy process, okay? So, what happened is that they use two different colors of uh, film, okay? Uh, that's called two strip, or either three different color film, three strip, combine it together and make it into color film, okay? So, here comes a famous example of Technicolor three strip. Let's have a look. Okay, so some youngsters might not know what this movie is, but uh, this movie is called Wizard of Oz, 1939. Yes, Dorothy, Eric remembers Dorothy, yes. And then she opened the door and there we go. Yes, Jerry. Wow. I'm telling you, wow. Okay. So what happened to the Wizard of Oz is that uh, 
this is a crazy story, okay? If you'd like to know, again, Google it. But I'm going to give you a brief, uh, a brief introduction about what happened here, okay? So basically, uh, the black and white stuff, okay? Okay, but first of all, this is not, uh, not the first color firm in the history, okay? I'm not sure why it's the first color firm in history. You may have to Google it. But uh, what happened is that... Um, okay, let me pause the movie first. Okay, sorry, I have to skip. Okay, so what happened here is that they actually colored the, uh, the black and white sequence, okay? They didn't color it firm. They actually colored the whole set into brown color. And even the makeup of the actors in the brown color. Okay, they already shot in uh, Technicolor already back then with this kind of technique. Okay, so they colored the whole thing physically inside the set. And then when Dorothy goes to the door, it was actually a double. So they don't have to really, uh, they don't really have to do another makeup for the real Dorothy again. Because this one, they cannot see the whole face of Dorothy, so they just got to stand in the extra double, okay, and another dog, okay, paint it in brown color, and then ask her to go open the dog. That's it, okay. It's not even a cut. It's basically they really painted everything into brown, okay, and then someone go and open the door, and then reveals the colorful space of uh, the of the whole film, okay. That is. That double meaning, another actor. Yes, correct. That is another actor that's not the real Dorothy. Yes, correct. Oh, thank you. Okay, so that is what happened in Wizard of Oz. Okay, but it's so expensive. It's way too, it's, they spend way too much. Okay, it's not even economical. Why? Because, let's say, last time when they shoot black and white, they only did one film strip. Okay, they only use a reel. But right now, with a Technicolor 2 strip or 3 strip, they need two different strips or three different strips of firms. So that is times three of the cost they need to spend, okay? Besides that, uh, when they're shooting this technique, they need to hire professionals on set to actually to say, okay, you need to shoot like that, you need to shoot like that, you need that kind of lighting, you need uh, this amount of lighting to actually able to produce this kind of look, okay? They need to hire professionals. And then they need to use a, an enormous amount of light. So what happened is that when they step into the set, it's crazily bright, okay? It's crazily bright until one of the actors actually suffers um, a long-term eye, uh, eye problem to, um, to his eye, okay? Long, uh, there's a long-term harm already. So back then, when they want to be able to do something new, they have to sacrifice a lot of things. Okay, yes, correct. Sacrifice for the arts. Okay, so that is what happened. All right, so again, the producers, uh, they say, you know what, guys, we spent too much. Okay, we are not going to spend so much money anymore on a firm. Can we come up with a new technique again? All right, so some brilliant guys came up with another brilliant idea again. Okay, and who they are, I'm sure some of you guys might know this guy. They are Kodak. Okay, Kodak. What they are famous for? They are famous for the film reel. Okay, they are famous for the films. Okay, so what happened is that Kodak actually developed a system to scan all the film, the physical film, into digital formats. Okay, and then they also came up with an idea that after scanning into a real, uh, into digital, which is one and zero, one and zero, it's not even a physical file at all. And then bring all these things, all the videos, okay? I'm going to separate it with digital videos and also physical films, okay? Film reels, okay? They scan the film reels in the digital format and then color it in the computer. So what is the software they used back then? Okay, drum rolls. They use Microsoft Paint. <laughs> Windows Movie Maker, yes. Okay. Of course, I'm just making fun of, of this, okay? Definitely not Microsoft Paint. Back then, confirmed on that Microsoft Paint, okay? And Microsoft Paint can't even color your video for you. Not even, a, not even a still picture, okay? So, 
That technology is called digital intermediate. Okay, so yes, uh, Windows 92 don't have that. Okay, I'm not sure. Okay, I started with Windows 97. Okay, so digital intermediate is a technology where after they scan films into digital format, and then what they do is that they color all the videos, okay, of digital, and then they use another hardware, okay, to actually print the films to into physical films again. Okay, so here in this picture over here, you will see Anmol, his name is called Dave Kasi. He is a very famous colorist in Hollywood. Okay, working in a company called Company Tree, where they also colored drum rolls, Avengers Endgame. Okay, this is a crazy huge company. They also colored the famous Asian film. Okay, the name is called Crazy Rich Asian. Okay, trust me, I tell you, they are a very huge company. Okay, so here. Back in, I'm not sure which year is this, I think the 1990s, okay? You will see all these panels and then all the, uh, all, an old Sony uh, uh, cathode ray tube TV, okay? CRT TV and then all these crazy tags here, all these crazy hardware, okay? And also a, a plate of food, okay? <laughs> That's very important to keep us safe, okay? So this is a digital intermediate. Why is it called intermediate? Because the, this process happens in the middle and then they use this crazy huge hardware to actually print it back on films again okay and this process is called recording back to film and this hardware is called every laser digital film recorder uh in malaysia we actually have it in our uh film development board uh, it's called finas okay we actually have this thing but uh, I think uh, they didn't use it for a very long time already, okay? So, no, this is not Wong from Dr. Space. Not all the Chinese bota or either Asian bota is Wong, okay? <laughs> Don't make fun of other people, lah, okay? Alright, so, um, this hardware is actually a very expensive hardware that actually prints film, in, uh, prints all whatever we color on digital into film again, okay? So, it's still usable now. We, uh, there's still this uh, machine available in the US, in Hollywood. Okay, I've seen it before. Okay, so again, people being people, again, human, we are very lazy and greedy. And then we think, okay, hmm, why not I come up with a way, you know, and a cost effective way and a more easier way to do films? So why not we go fully digital? Okay, which is what we have right now today. It's called Digital Color Grading System. Okay, so this is a facility called Airy Media Grading Suite in Germany. Okay, um, it's actually a colorist here working on an astronaut-like panel. Okay, and with a multiple screens and a big screen in a very cinema-like en uh, environment. Okay, basically all these uh, color grading company, what they do is that they have to build a color grading suite similar to the cinema. So the colorist will work in this kind of environment to make color grading to look exactly how it looked like in the cinema for all the normal people like us. Okay. So in Malaysia, yes, we have this kind of facility. So there's one, uh, actually a few of them. Okay. Uh, the one in KL is actually called uh, Base Camp. They also do, uh, recently they also make uh, they actually get to do uh, what is it called? I can't remember the Netflix series. Uh, Ghost Bright, yes, Ghost Bright. They actually did Ghost Bright in uh, Base Camp as well. And then also, uh, when the Hollywood guys they came to Malaysia to shoot, they will also rent this space to actually do some uh, color processing here and then they bring it back to US. Okay, so Crazy Rich Asian is one of them. And then Marco Polo is also one of the place they actually get to do something here as well. And then the, another company is actually in uh, Johor Pinewood Iskandar. But too bad it's not called Pinewood anymore. In uh, Johor now, it's actually called uh, Iskandar Malaysia Studio, IMS, correct. Yes, okay. 
So IMS is actually a place, it's a huge studio, but they also have color grading, uh, color grading suite in there. Okay, it's crazily big, crazily advanced, and it's awesome. Okay, so it used to, um, it used to be under a company called uh, Imagica, but then they closed down again because of business problems. Uh, not a lot of people have the money to go into uh, Imagica to do color grading, it's way too expensive. Okay, so next, what happened after having digital color grading system? Of course firm stock is there, right? Because we are all cost, we are going for cost effective, we are going for digital, therefore firm stock is there. But, okay, I'm just kidding. Okay, because why? Firm stock actually made a comeback. Okay, what happened is that the Hollywood guys still love firms. They still prefer shooting with analog firms. They still like the texture, they still like to touch firm. They are a little bit more old school people, okay? So, one of the most famous examples, the short arm film, is called Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Okay? Directed by the famous Quentin Tarantino. Okay? Not only that, all the IMAX film that actually shot on IMAX, they are actual 60mm or 70, 65mm, 70mm film. Okay? 60mm, 70mm. 70mm, yeah. But some of them is 60 or 60, I can't remember. Okay? So, they are a huge camera that actually still roll on firm, okay? So firm is not dead, firm is back, okay? If you see all the Hollywood uh, behind the scenes, you see like a huge thing, round round thing at the back of the camera, that is a firm reel. They are shooting digital and firm at the same time for backups and things like that. I have no idea how it works, but that is how they work, okay? Hollywood, the city of dreams where everybody would love to be a star, okay? Hollywood. I'd like to introduce you Da Vinci Resolve. Yes, La La Land, one of my favorite movies. I love the song. Okay, so Da Vinci Resolve is a, uh, I'm sure to those who have already attended the class last week, they know about Da Vinci Resolve already. Okay, but I'd like to cover it more about history of Da Vinci Resolve. Today, we are going to learn extensively on the color grading page on DaVinci Resolve. Okay, so I'd like to go into the history of DaVinci Resolve. First of all, I want to ask you, how much is DaVinci Resolve 10 years ago? Okay guys, I gave you guys uh, one minute or two minutes. Please give me a reply on the chat box and I'd like to know how much do you think is DaVinci Resolve 10 years ago? Alright guys, show me the answer. Come on, let's do this. Lie, lie, lie. Lie, lie, lie. 5K, 10 million, 1.8K. Okay. 1499, Daryl Chong. Thank you, Daryl. 5K, Miranda. Maxim, 10K. Kiefer, 1K USD. Guys, 10 years ago, okay? 10 years ago, Joseph Gunn, USD, 2005. Kelvin Felix, 10K, 30 USD. 30 USD, no way lah. Oh, Eric Wong, 30k USD. Alright, guys, I'm going to review the answer. The answer is... <laughs> USD 200,000. Okay? <laughs> and that is software only. That is not including the hardware. Okay? Yes, not even one kidney, Paul. It's crazy. No, it's not even two. It's more than that. One kidney now can only buy an iPhone. Okay, 10 years ago, it was USD, $200,000. Correct, and buy two house. Yes, okay. So, imagine USD, 200000 Who the heck in the world can actually afford color grading? You are crazy. First of all, the software is really USD, 200000 Who can actually afford it, right? Nobody, nobody in Malaysia will actually pay this kind of amount to do color grading. No way, okay? 10 years ago, so expensive, bloody expensive. So, the, when the color cost is too high, nobody can actually afford it. What happened to the company? Bankrupt law, correct or not? Okay, so 10 years ago, when they bankrupt, what happened? Black Magic Design bought over, uh, it wasn't named as Da Vinci Resort back then, it's called Da Vinci System. Okay. 
So that magic design brought over Da Vinci system. What happened is that when Da Vinci system died off bankrupt, the boss of Black Magic Design, Grand Petty, he looked into his pocket and then into his uh, income statement on uh, Black Magic Design, and then he said, "Hmm, I have some money, lah. Okay, uh, let's buy off, lah. Let's buy Da Vinci, lah. Okay, so." He buy off the Finji system and then go through like a few months of R and D, and then he make he actually make a comeback, and then launch, uh, Da Vinci Resolve, back then in the year two thousand nine, okay, in a huge 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 event called NAB in Las Vegas, and then he made a crazy announcement, and the crazy announcement is called. Price drop. Imagine, few months ago, some guy actually have to spend USD two hundred thousand to buy Da Vinci Resolve software, and now this guy in year twenty ten he only spend nine nine five, and then you can buy Da Vinci Resolve ready. Imagine you buy her house that cost five hundred thousand, and then the next day MCO happens, COVID nineteen happens, and then ah、uh, the developer go and announce, eh.、Hey, I think ah、uh, nobody's gonna buy my house already lah.、Like, I'm going to drop the price to ah、uh, 10k. You crazy or not? You go crazy or not? Of course I'll go crazy. Ouch! Correct. Yes, Eric. Ouch! It's a big, big ouch to all the Hollywood players. Okay. But nevertheless, it's def it's definitely beneficial to all the other people who used to can't ah、uh, afford color grading. Okay. And then now in year 2020. Black Magic Design actually announces that you know what nine nine five US dollar is still too expensive lah. Okay, I'm going to give you more discount. I'm going to make it only two hundred ninety nine US dollar now. That is for the big version. But Black Magic Design is also very kind. They actually launch a free version for everyone to do color grading and editing and whatsoever using DaVinci Resolve today. Okay, so. What else besides editing software? Black Magic Design used to be a hard, ah,、uh, a company that do a lot of half ah、uh, hardware. Okay, so they are also very famous in the hardware. So one of the hardware that is famous now is called the camera. Okay, so this is an actual camera where they um ah、uh, actual camera they use in Malaysia. Okay, so um I used to work for this company. It's called Kinoi Pictures, and I actually get to calibrate this phone called Shadow Play. For those of you who attended the sharing last week, they will get to know what shadow play about. Okay, so this is the camera that we use on set. It's called the Ursa Mini by Black Magic Design. Okay, so here you can see ah、uh, how how our cameras look on set, and then、uh, this is the director Tony Pietra. This is Pravin, the director of photography. Basically, the cameraman, but we don't call him cameraman. Okay, we call him director of photography. All right. Okay. So what we did is also we actually edited on set. So there is me looking uh a bit serious, I think so. Okay, and then with a、uh, huge hard disk, and then we actually set up a tent. No joke, we set up a tent on set, and then bring our iMac. Everything goes on set ready. Okay, so they also have the live production cameras. Okay, not only for film, they also have live production cameras. So the recent um. The Lito Langkawi, the the bicycle event, they also uses the、uh, Black Magic Persa broadcast to actually do live broadcast. I think it's a four K broadcast. I can't remember two like yeah HD or four K. I can't remember. But then yes, they use、uh, Black Magic Persa broadcast, and then they also have the panel for their live productions, and they also have their film cameras. Okay, this is what we use on set the Persa Mini. Okay. And then they also have the cost-effective, ah,、uh, option. It's called the Black Magic Pocket Cinema Camera. Not very expensive. It's only one thousand two hundred and ninety-five dollars. Okay, it's the most cost-effective camera that I've ever seen in the world. Okay, so small and so good. Okay, and then for being an international brand, they also have a Malaysian distributor. It's called Three Dots. Okay, they are the guys who actually. Are responsible to bring in all the hardware from Black Magic Design into camera for people to buy. Okay, so if you guys are interested to buy anything from them, let me know. 
So I can hook you up with them because I'm very close uh, with the distributors. Okay, so three dots. Okay, if you guys can see all the pricing are in Malaysian ringgit, more friendly to see is the US dollar. Okay, US dollar is like so cheap, looks so cheap, right? But when it comes to RM, it suddenly boom, becomes so big number already. Okay, so not only that, they also have international trade shows. Okay, uh, the famous trade show in US is called NAB. It happens annually in Las Vegas. Okay, Las Vegas, crazy, crazy, crazy. And then also NBC, I think it's in uh, UK. And then uh, in Amsterdam, there's also another one. And the closest to us is actually called Broadcast Asia in Singapore. It happens annually June. I think so. Can't remember. April or June. Okay, so this is their booth. Okay, if you go there, this is one of the biggest booths you can see. Black Magic Design, very chante, everything they have. Um, their software, their hardware, everything is there, displayed there, okay? And I am very proud to say, I was one of the speakers two years ago, okay? My boss, my ex-boss and I were invited there to actually share a bit about um, WG Resolve, uh, editing, color grading about WG Resolve, okay? So we get to share the workflow and stuff like that, okay? So... It's a very cool trade show where we actually give sharings to like international people, okay? There are so many other different people there. Oh my goodness, I tell you, I'm so kanchong there, okay? So, this is the sales manager of that magic design. Yes, Russell at their uh, booth, okay? So, if you guys have a chance, this is a filmmaking event. For three days, they have so many cool stuff to see. I tell you, if you are a geek, you freak out like, wow, so many things to see, okay? But right now, because of COVID-19, we don't have it anymore, so everything's happened virtually. 